What? Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Fort Bend County Law Library, and this is another installment of our attorney lecture series. We've had many of these over the years, and uh, it's an opportunity to have members of our legal community come and give lectures of interest to uh, attorneys, the general public, uh, and we're lucky today to have back one of our previous presenters, uh, Annie Scott. Uh, she previously presented on expunctions and non-disclosures. Uh, that video is available on our YouTube page. Uh, she's back with us again to talk about jury selection or otherwise known as Vore Dyer. Uh, we're very lucky to have her. She's an experienced attorney uh, here in Fort Bend County and in various counties around the area. Uh, she's been in practice for almost 15 years, uh, primarily concentrating on criminal defense, but also on juvenile and some other areas of family law, uh, state and probate and so forth. Um, she's a real supporter of uh, the law library. Uh, one, she comes here and uses it herself. Uh, and two, uh, she's just a general supporter of us as well. And we're very lucky in that respect and that she gives her time to us uh, and her presence. Um, she's real dedicated. I can just tell by, I've worked with her uh, just as a law librarian over the years uh, and just by watching her work, uh, and looking at her attitude towards how she does her job. She's very dedicated uh, in all manner uh, towards her clients, uh, towards justice, uh, towards being a learned attorney uh, and keeping up with everything uh, that she has to, to enable her to do her job. And uh, so uh, she's an author. Uh, she's very passionate about her practice. Uh, and she puts that into things such as what she writes on. Um, she has a book uh, called Still Human, and it's about getting past your criminal history. Uh, and that's why she lectures on things such as expunctions and non-disclosures, because, you know, being a criminal defense attorney isn't necessarily just about uh, the immediate trial and defense of a case. It's also about the aftermath, because uh, people have to keep on being human, uh, living after uh, dealing with their criminal charges. So uh, we're, like I said, we're very lucky, very pleased to have Annie Scott uh, take time from her Friday afternoon to uh, uh, give us a lecture, and uh, I'll let you take it away, Annie. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for your kind words, and I really enjoy working with you guys. So today we are going to talk about Vordire. Um, Vordier is how some people pronounce it, and it's mainly going to be geared toward um, my practice, my primary practice area, which is criminal defense. Um, I know that there are jury selections happening in many different types of legal cases, uh, but today I'm going to just give you some insight mainly on criminal defense jury selection. So when a case is initially filed in the criminal courts, it goes through the prosecutor's office. Um, the individual is either assigned an appointed criminal defense attorney or he retains his own attorney. In those very rare occasions, he will represent himself. Um, after the initial you know, filing of the case, the case will go through the court processes. And then at some point, if no negotiation and no settlement is reached after those negotiations, then the case will be set for trial. And that's where we get to our lecture today. And that is jury selection. So jury selection is very important. Um, we call it jury selection, we call it voir dire, we call it voir dire, but at the end of the day, it's really deselection. You want to find those individuals who are sitting in the panel of our uh, jury who should not or do not want um, or cannot sit fairly on the case. Um, and so, for instance, from the defense side, we are looking for jurors who are going to be fair and neutral going into the case for our client. And I'm sure that the state of Texas would ideally like the same sort of juror. So in our, in our country, we have a term that everyone has probably heard, and that is presumed innocent. And so one of the first things that we cover in our jury selection is the presumption of innocence. So just going back a little bit, both the state 
of Texas and their prosecutors who will represent the state of Texas and the defense who is represented by a defense attorney like myself will have so many amounts of time, so much amount of time that the judge allots us to conduct this jury selection. Um, he could give us 15 minutes on a, a minor case. He could give us 30 minutes on a case that's a little bit you know, more complicated and, and he could give us up to four or five hours on a very serious criminal case. Um, we use that time, both the state of Texas and us um, on the defense side, we use that time again to question the jurors. So those questions are going to be in relation to our particular side of the case, whether we be on the state or the defense. Uh, as I mentioned, there is the presumption of innocence. Uh, the defendant, the person charged with the offense is given that presumption of innocence from the start. When he walks into the courtroom, he is presumed innocent. When he's charged with this offense, he is presumed innocent. And so one of the first things that we wanna cover in our jury selection on the defense side is this presumption. And so some of the questions that we may ask that are going to help us to feel out those individuals um, who may or may not be neutral um, in regard to this topic uh, would be how many of you for instance, um, let's just say a DWI case. How many of you, uh, when you walked into the courtroom today, looked over at the defense table, tried to figure out who is the individual who is charged, who is the defendant, and then automatically assumed that because he's sitting here, he must have done something. You know, because he's sitting here, he must be guilty, in other words. So that question for Vordar goes to the presumption of innocence because the jury members and the particular jury members who feel that that person sitting at that defense table is guilty of something or he wouldn't be here, they're not in a neutral position. If, they're, if you're in a neutral position, you come in, you look around, you kind of have an idea of what's going on, maybe you don't, but you sit down and you listen and you wait for instruction. Uh, you don't develop opinions and you don't have judgments initially going into the case. And so that is one of the questions in a very big area of uh, voir dire for defense attorneys. Now on the state side, and I was a prosecutor uh, for a couple of years when I first started practicing law, one of the questions that we would ask in the, under the same umbrella of presumption of innocence is how many of you um, have had a bad experience with police officers? And the reason that question would be asked uh, by the state is because if you have a, um, have had a bad experience with a police officer, you may be inclined to either not believe the officer or you may be inclined to not give his testimony or decision making in this off in this case or opinions in this case you may not want to give it much weight and so you thus don't presume that the officer is going to tell the truth you have a um you have a, an actual bias of some sort because of whatever experiences you have. And there's nothing wrong with that. The, the most important thing that both sides in jury selection and the judge himself or herself will tell you is you are entitled to your opinions, no matter what they are. If you don't like police officers, that's fine. That's your opinion. If you don't like the person sitting at the defense table, that's fine. That's your opinion. The key and the most important thing in jury selection is for you to let the parties know, to let the attorneys know, to let the judge know that you don't, you don't, you can't sit there and start from square one. You can't sit, you can't sit there and not have already gone toward step two and step three. You've already reached some sort of opinion and maybe already had some, um, some bias uh, coming into it. 
And that's not a bad thing. It's just, we all, we're all human. We all have our own opinions. We have our own biases. Um, and so, like I say, the important thing is just letting the lawyers and the judge know. So then we get to um, one of the other topics in, in criminal defense is beyond a reasonable doubt. So everyone has probably heard beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, there is no legal definition for it in Texas. Uh, there used to be. And I think most of the states in our country don't actually have a legal definition for beyond a reasonable doubt. But what it is not, and the state usually makes this argument, what it is not is beyond all doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because the state has the burden of proof, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but the state has the burden. The state has to prove that the individual that is charged uh, did what they have charged him with, and they have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And so they want to make sure that those members of the jury who get to actually sit on the panel um, and observe the trial and reach the decision, a verdict, uh, they want to make sure that they are not being held to the highest standard, which is impossible. And that is beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond all doubt. Uh, the only way that the state could make that high bar is if they were there. And so they don't want to have um, people on the jury who are going to hold them to that high bar because they weren't there. And what they're going to bring before you are witnesses, some who were there, some who were not there, but have some information to help them try to prove their case. Um, for the defense, beyond a reasonable doubt, is we want to make sure that we are having jury members who are going to hold the state to that burden um, of proving it beyond all reasonable doubt. And that means to us that once you have seen all of the witnesses and you have heard all of the evidence, if you're selected on the panel, then you don't have any reasonable doubt in your mind and you can comfortably with your conscience and your morals and you can make a decision, you can reach a verdict. And so that's really hard to do. I know verdicts happen every day. I know trials are concluded every day. Um, for misdemeanors, you have to have six members on the jury reach that verdict. For felonies, you have to have 12 members on that jury to reach that verdict. And it's really not easy to do. Um, and so that's why proving the state having to prove beyond a reasonable doubt is so high because we don't want to, in our country, sentence someone for something that they didn't do or sentence someone for something that we're not sure that they did uh, or sentence someone for something that maybe they did it. Um, as a jury member, when you're, when you're actually on the panel, you can't reach a verdict or you shouldn't reach a verdict um, thinking, I don't really know, but it's more likely that he did than he didn't. And then you reach a verdict and render a verdict of guilty. That should never happen. So jury selection is created for the purpose of finding 12 or six fair-minded, neutral people who can listen to the evidence, who can weigh that evidence, and who can then render a verdict after having heard all of that and considered all of that. Another thing about uh, jury selection too is um, really not jury selection, but juries in general, uh, in order to reach a verdict in a trial, everyone on the panel has to reach the same verdict. That's the only way you get a verdict. So all six of you in a misdemeanor case and all 12 of you in a felony case have to agree that the state has proven its case in order to reach a guilty verdict. Um, if even one of you doubts that the state has proven it and you find that um, you're not sure, then 
you have to you have to stick with your decision and the rest of you you know stick with your decision and, and that's where we have a mistrial so back to the points that we are looking for in Bordar. we've gone over the presumption of innocence and how it's important for the defense and how it's important for the state and what it means to both of them we have talked briefly about beyond a reasonable doubt while it's having it doesn't have a legal a legal definition it does still mean that all reasonable doubt has to have left your mind in order for you to render a verdict one way or another. Um, and so one of the other uh, uh, topics that is, is of the utmost important in jury selection is the Fifth Amendment, the, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. And that is that you have the right to remain silent. That right applies to all of us. Um, every day, we have a right to remain silent. And when you are confronted with uh, questioning and interrogation by law enforcement, you have an absolute right to not answer or not say a word. Um, and so when we are in trial and the state is standing before you and they're presenting um, their questions for you as potential uh, veneermen on this trial, they are going to ask you, um, or they're actually going to instruct you that if the defendant, the person charged, does not testify, you cannot hold that against them. And that's probably as much as they're going to belabor that point, because to them, it's not that important. It is the Constitution, and if you violate it, the whole trial gets thrown out. But for them, they're just going to instruct you, and the judge is also going to instruct you that the defendant does not have to testify he can plead the fifth, or he can just not say anything at all. He doesn't have to even rise and take the stand. And if he does not do that, you cannot hold that against him. Now, it's a little bit more in depth for the defense, and that's my role, is to come to you and make sure that you are not going to hold it against my client if he doesn't say anything, if he chooses to not testify. And some of the questions that I may ask you, as an example, is if my client is accused of a really heinous crime and you're sitting there and you're on the panel and you're hearing, you know, all the questions that the state has asked and, and you've heard some of the questions that I've asked, but now we're at the point where you want to know, will my client testify? And I tell you, my client is not going to testify, or I'm not sure if my client's going to testify or not. What do you think of that? I would guess that there would be several people on the panel that will raise their hand or just blurt out, well, why wouldn't he testify? And my response to that is, what would, what would be a good reason why someone would not want to, to testify. And another jury member would say, maybe he has a speech impediment and he knows that if he stutters or he trips over his words, or if he just doesn't sound very good, very strong in his, in his uh, communication, someone may consider that evidence of his guilt or an indication of his guilt because he can't just blurt it out. He can't just speak clearly. Another jury member may say, one of the most popular and number one reasons why people don't speak is because they have a fear of public speaking. There are so many people who have a lot to say, but they are terrified of speaking in public in front of masses of people, even if it's just a courtroom of 12 or a courtroom of 20 that are sitting there observing the trial. And so another person may raise their hand and say, maybe he doesn't speak because his lawyer has instructed him to. And I like that, I like that response. All the other responses are great, but I really like that one because these individuals that have been charged with an offense follow our lead as their lawyers. We have and we have guided their hand 
from the very initial stages of this case until right now where we're sitting at trial and we're trying to pick a jury of their peers to hear their case and render a verdict. And one of the instructions that I've given my clients on a, on quite a few occasions is to just sit there and listen. You're not going to say a word and you're not going to testify. And that's because there are many reasons, but one of them is because it's not our burden to do so. We don't have to prove we didn't do it. And that's one of the things that I think we get the most, you know, get incorrect the most here um, in our in our country is you don't have to prove you didn't do it. The state has to prove that you did. And if they don't prove that you did, and they are the first presenters, they start first. They get to put their witnesses on first. They get to sit closer to the jury. They get to do everything first because it is their burden. And if at the end of their case, when they rest, if they have not proven it, I'm not going to tell my client to go and sit on the stand and testify. More than likely, he's going to get tripped up by an experienced prosecutor who's been practicing inter and interrogating people for decades. And he does not know how to handle that. He does not know how to respond to that. And more importantly, he's terrified of it because he's only been working with me since the onset of the case. So I'm not going to put him out there to be eaten by the wolves. So I say, sit down and be quiet and observe the trial. Let me take care of it because that's what you either hired me to do or that's what the court has appointed me to do. That is to represent you and your best interest. And it is not in your best interest to testify. So that's one reason why um, our clients may not testify. And that's one reason why uh, the Fifth Amendment is very important. Another, um, another thing about the uh, Fifth Amendment is, and it may be confusing, but he doesn't actually have to stand up and say, I plead the Fifth. He doesn't have to say anything. So if you're ever chosen for a jury and you uh, see our client sitting there next to us and they never do anything but sit there and be still and watch the jury, watch the trial, it's because he doesn't have to do anything else. He doesn't have to actually say, I plead the fifth. It is implied because it's a constitutional right that we all have. And he exercises it simply by sitting there and not going up to the stand. So that's all I have on the Fifth Amendment. Um, one of the uh, um, other things that the state would vardar on is having one witness. So there are many, many cases where the crime or offense occurred and there was only two people there. The person who was um, uh, harmed, maybe, and the person who is accused of doing it. And so if we were to have an assault case, for example, and you know, the young lady said the guy pushed her on the ground and then he ran away. The state is going to ask you all as potential jury members, um, would you be able, after hearing all the facts and hearing all the evidence, and that evidence shows that some, you know, he pushed her, would you be able to reach a verdict of guilty if there were no other witnesses involved? And believe it or not, that is a very difficult question for some people. That's a very difficult circumstance, um, a set of facts for some people. Um, but it happens every day, you know, um, in the same sort of example, you know, you're walking down the street and someone passes by and just pushes you for no reason. There may be hundreds of people around, but no one had their eyes on you and on this other individual. So we need jury members as the state who can say, if I hear all the evidence and I can believe beyond a reasonable doubt that that guy sitting at that table did push her, and it's because she clearly identified him. She clearly identified an article of clothing he was wearing. She clearly identified his height and his weight and eye color and hair color and the hat he had on. And he still had all those things on when he was arrested. So it was corroborated by the police officer who then arrested him. Um, 
would you be able to convict? And so I, I think after those those facts, I think most of you would maybe say, yeah. Um, sometimes there's always one who's like, no, that's still not enough. But it happens. And that's what jury selection is for, to find out how people think and what they think and are their thoughts going to hinder or help the prosecution or the defense? Because ideally, we want someone whose ideas are just neutral. That's what the state wants. That's what the defense wants. Um, you may start to hear the case and then lean more toward the state or lean more toward the defense. But it's only after hearing the facts and hearing some testimony and seeing some evidence that you then start to develop an opinion and start leaning more toward what your eventual verdict may be. And that could also change throughout the trial as well. You may start out one way, but after seeing something or a key witness or a key piece of evidence, you change your mind. And now you're leaning more toward that, that way, the other way. And that's how it should be. That's how trials are meant to be. You're supposed to render your verdict after hearing all of the evidence. And so um, going into it with, an, with a formed opinion, is exactly why Vordar was created so that we can stop that, you know, from happening. Um, another point that we in the defense side like to reach and discuss in Vordar is defense. If we have a self-defense argument as the defense, we are going to bring that up in Vordar. Um, and so with the example that I had just given, of the of the guy pushing the young lady and making her fall off the sidewalk. If the facts changed or we added a few more facts to that and we find out that the young lady um, was walking down the sidewalk and then she picked up a brick and she called out to this guy, I don't know if she knew him or not, but she called out to him and he looked at her and then she threw the brick at him. And it missed him, and he came up to her and he pushed her, and she fell down. Well, now that changes the story a little bit, doesn't it? And so, as the defense, I want to know how do you feel about self defense? We all live in Texas, I think. Um, and in Texas, you have a right to stand your ground, you have a right to self defense, uh, you have a right to defend others if necessary. And so, our law provides for that, but for dire is a time to see, can the individuals who are sitting here on the panel actually follow the law? If this young lady had a brick in her hand and she intentionally called out and then took that initiative and threw it forward toward this individual and missed him, and he thought she was going to do something else. And he came over and he pushed her and said, what's wrong with you? And she fell down. I want to know how the jury members feel about that. And so I'm going to ask them, who believes that you have a right to defend yourself if someone is going to attack you? And I want everyone that believes that to raise their hand. And then I'm going to ask the Contra, which is who doesn't think that you have a right to believe, to, uh, defend yourself if someone tries to attack you. And there will be one or two people who raise their hand. Um, there are just some people, and I'm I'm you know always just surprised, there are some people who they don't care what anyone does to them, they will not fight back. And I, I don't judge that. That is their position, that is their opinion, that is their moral compass. And if that's how they feel, I just wanna know about it. And that's why we have jury selection. Um, so we may give a few more hypotheticals like that, um, to really try to get to who is of what belief and how that affects us. Now, after all the questioning has been done, the state has asked all the questions that they're, they're going to ask for Vordar, the defense, my side has asked all the questions that I'm going to ask for Vordar, the judge is going to then send the panel out and you know, we each are gonna talk about those who are gonna be excused for cause. Um, and there are two reasons to excuse a jury, a jury member. Um, one is for cause, and I'll talk about that. And the other is just a preemptory challenge. 
And so preemptory challenges, you can release them because you just don't want them on your jury. Maybe they were wearing blue and you know anyone who wears blue is, you know, not going to help you in a case where, I don't know, whatever. You can have whatever reason for a peremptory challenge. You don't like the boots they walked in on. They wear cowboy boots. You don't want anyone on your jury that wears cowboy boots. So you kick them off. You get a f you get only a few of those. Each in, in misdemeanor is three and in, 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 in felony, I believe it's six. So you only get so many that you can kick off for no reason. But the others are the challenges for cause. And challenges for cause are basic, they're legitimate, they're legal reasons why this person cannot and should not sit on your jury. Some of those challenges for cause are, they, this juror said, I hate the state. I hate all cops. I hate the prosecution. I hate the state and the government. And they're always trying to lock people up. That is a challenge for cause. They cannot be fair. No way, no sh no, no way, no shape, no how. They're out. Jury, the judge is going to strike them. They're going to be free to leave. Another way um, uh, that applies on a challenge for cause is if the juror has been convicted of a felony. And, you know, we 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 bring people into jury, uh, jury panel uh, by your voter registration card. But we don't run your background when we do that. So the clerk panel impanels this juror. They're from all walks of life. And if the state, in its due diligence while we're sitting there, runs the background of all the jury members, they're going to find out that juror number 10 has a felony. He is now ineligible. He cannot serve on a jury. Um, another challenge for cause is that, you know, someone says, because of my religion, I cannot sit in judgment of another person. That is admirable. That is fine. That is your moral compass. But that is a challenge for cause because they cannot sit and they will not sit. For the state or the defense, they're not for either. They just can't sit. Um, another challenge for cause is if um, they made their mind up that one of the first questions I asked you was how many thought he was guilty simply because he was charged simply because he was sitting there. They've already made their mind up and they say so. That is a challenge for cause because they no longer, they cannot be fair and they will not be impartial. They've already made their decision without hearing any evidence. Um, and there are always several members coming in, you know, with that, with that um, perception. And so we try to help, you know, educate and, and ask more questions and broaden their thinking so that they can see that it's just a charge and it's not a proof and all that, but sometimes it doesn't go very far and the judge will release them for that reason. Um, and so some, you know, these are the truths. These are the legal truths. And when you're in jury selection and you've been truthful and you've told the lawyers and the judges everything that you think that they need to know, and you've answered every question that you believe you could, provide a response to, you've done your due diligence, you've served your um, civic duty by being there in the first place to even be in panel in the juror, in the jury. And so if you're chosen, then you go on to sit and observe the trial and render your, your verdict. If you're not chosen, we thank you for your civic duty. We thank you for your service and you're free to go home. And I think you get five or six dollars or something uh, which a lot of times people just uh, donate back. But, you know, that's that's what jury selection is. Does anyone have any questions? Because I see we're running into our last five minutes. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat and I will answer them. Or you can unmute yourself as well and I will try to answer them. Jonathan, do they have the ability to chat or unmute? And you're muted too, Jonathan. All right, um, I'll go ahead and unmute everybody. Uh, and if any, anybody has any questions. No, no questions, uh, great job. Uh, very, very clear uh, explanation. Very helpful. Thank Great you. Great reminders. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I didn't tell anyone how to avoid jury service. <laughs> <laughs>
fight to avoid getting picked for the jury. <laughs> I, I like how you I like how you presented just some not say big concepts, but you didn't uh you kind of put up about half a dozen areas to really think about when selecting a jury and what has to be covered and so forth. So really good. Thank you. Thank you. I've actually been called to jury service a handful of times. I've never gotten chosen. Uh, my husband got called once and he was chosen, even though he told them I'm married to a criminal defense lawyer. <laughs> and they're like, okay, you can be fair and impartial. And he said, yep, sure can. And he was. But um, usually if you're an attorney, especially a criminal defense attorney, you will not make it on a jury, almost any jury. Um, if you're a police officer, you almost will never make it onto a jury, um, uh, especially criminal juries. Maybe you might make it onto a civil jury. Um, and then I think some of the some of the groups that we as as uh, criminal defense lawyers uh, look out for are nurses. Obviously, for many reasons, we we don't usually uh, like to have a nurse on the jury unless they have. We believe they have some. Uh, helpful information for this particular case and the evidence is going to show something that they're then going to take and elaborate on back there when they're deliberating and that would help us. Um, engineers are very, very good for a jury because they're very analytical. They know processes and they sit there and they take everything apart and they put it all back together. And usually you'll find after they've done that, there's a lot of reasonable doubt because things just don't fit. And so I love to have engineers on, on my juries um, because of that reason. Um, I like thinkers. If, you, if you're a thinker and you express in, your, in, in our jury selection that you like to think and you give me thoughtful questions, I believe that that's gonna be useful in almost every case because sometimes it's just not cut and dry. You have to analyze each little part and every fact and you will see whether or not there's reasonable doubt there. And in most cases there are, but in some cases it's, no, I'm sorry, it's just dead to rights, you got it. Uh, but we still have to put on a defense and we still have to do our job. So that's what I enjoy. Well, hey, I wanna thank Annie for taking the time and, and giving us some good knowledge and some things to think about and sharing her expertise and experience. Um, and I want to thank everybody who take the time today, especially on a Friday afternoon, to attend. Uh, I hope it's been some good information for y'all. Uh, and like I said, this is going to be up on our YouTube page and so forth amongst many of our other classes. And uh, also, don't forget us as a resource. You're down here at the Justice Center. Uh, or if you just uh, need some information, either come see us or shoot us an email, give us a call. Uh, we're really glad to help. So thank you, everybody, and Annie, and uh, y'all have a good weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sears.